Hi everyone, welcome to Top 10 Middle Game Ideas number 5, The Attack on Opposite Wings. Um, there are two cases I want to talk about in, uh, with respect to the attack on opposite wings, and the first case I'm going over in this video and the second case I'll be talking about in the next video. The first case is where both sides have castled to opposite sides, and then they proceed to attack their opponent's king position. Uh, and then uh, in the second case, we'll look at attacks on opposite wings where the kings uh, are not necessarily the subject of the attack. But coming back to this case, um, these are the kinds of positions that really lead to the, the sharpest uh, lines in chess and some of the most dangerous and razor-edged positions because a single misstep can send uh, either side uh, to a very quick demise. So these, are, these positions require a lot of um, calculating ability and also uh, really good judgment. You often have to um, make a call. These positions look like a race to start with, and the side that gets there first often will just break through and win. But uh, sometimes a key defensive move will slow down your opponent's attack just enough that you can overtake him on the opposite side, and then your attack will break through first. So... Um, so a strong stomach as well as uh, strong calculating abilities and good judgment are required to play these kind of positions. Uh, the first example I wanted to show you was a game played in 1974 between Boris Spassky and David Levy. It was played at the Olympiad in France. Spassky at this time was the former world champion. He had just uh, recently lost the world championship match to Bobby Fischer. But he was still uh, one of the very top players in the world at that time. And his opponent, uh, David Levy, not as strong a player. He was a um, British international master. He was also interested in computer science, too. He, he did a lot of work with uh, uh, computers in the early days before computers were as good as, uh, as people. And in fact, he had a bet. Uh, in, he started in uh, 1968. He bet 500 pounds against a uh, with some AI researchers that in 10 years no uh, computer would able be, would be able to defeat him in a match. And uh, he won that bet. And then uh, he renewed the bet and uh, he finally lost it in 1989 when, uh, when IBM came up with Deep Blue and he lost to that computer. But that was, you know, 20 years later. So he was certainly right at the time when he made that first bet. Anyway, he had just written a book about the, uh, the dragon the Sicilian dragon, and that's the position we get to. So both sides, it seems, are happy to play into one of these really sharp positions. So I'm going to go through the opening in this game, and then in the subsequent games, I'll probably just start right in the middle game. But uh, yeah, let's get going. So e4, c5, a Sicilian. Knight f3, d6. Could still be any kind of Sicilian. Spassky puts the pawn in the center, going for the open Sicilian. Levy plays knight f6. Spassky defends with knight c3, and now g6, so the characteristic move of the dragon Sicilian. We have that dragon pawn structure. Um, Spassky plays bishop e3, and this is all really standard. Uh, we'll get to a moment of deviation shortly. So f3, knight c6, queen d2, just uh, going directly for the attack and preparing to castle queen side. White castles, I mean black castles, white throws in the move bishop to c4. Black goes bishop d7, and uh, white castles. And you can think of this as the starting position of the game in a way, because everything up to now has been very standard. Um, <clears throat> in modern play, they don't often bring this bishop out so quickly. Sometimes they'll delay bringing that out and start launching some pawns forward first. But this was uh, this is still a very common way to play it, and uh, it, was, it was absolutely standard at the time. Notice that both sides have got all their pieces out. So uh, all four minor pieces have been developed by white and by black. And uh, black, although black's position is maybe, uh, well, it's all concentrated on the, the first three ranks. So it's definitely got less space here. But his bishops have good diagonals. So there's potential in black's position as well. Um, it's kind of an economical development. And it's a very solid pawn structure. So right here is where David Levy played the first uh, innovative move. He played queen to b8. And this is still in the database. I guess it's been tried a few times since then. Uh, more common is rook to c8. But uh, I think he had an idea here of just uh, quickly launching these pawns forward. And the queen is over here opposite uh, white's king. 
so that, well, not opposite directly, but on the same side of the board as White's King, so that it can participate in an attack very quickly. So Spassky wastes no time and plays h4. Uh, Black follows up with a5, so the race is on. Um, Spassky throws in this move bishop h6, very common in the uh, playing in playing against the dragon to try and trade off this this bishop, which is a strong piece on this diagonal. And uh, you know it, it may be an idea that uh, Levy had to coordinate this bishop with this queen on the b2 square. So, but in any case, this is a standard move in the against the dragon to try and trade off that bishop. And if black takes, the queen can come here, and then if the pawn comes forward to open up that line, there's there's a kind of ready-made h-file attack. So black doesn't take. Um, Levy fight tried something really unusual here. He actually decided that he wanted to keep this bishop, and he was willing to give up the exchange in order to do it. So he came up with this really uh, interesting tactical solution. He played knight takes e4. So um, this knight is hitting the queen, and so this means that um, there's no time for white to uh, grab the bishop. He has to take back the knight, and then black can grab this knight. That's the point. The bishop is supported by the knight on c6, so the queen can't take back there. But, uh, but he is giving up the exchange here, and bishop takes f8 is a possible move. It's possible that this is how he intended the game to go. Um, Spassky did not play this, but um, if this move had been played, um, you know, actually I'm not sure what, uh, what Levy's intention was at this point. If he was worried about Spassky's attack, he could have brought the queen over this way to defend. If he was interested in focusing on his own attack, he might have just planned to take with the king. And now we can get in this uh, b5 move, kicking the bishop, and uh, and perhaps the king can run away from the attack over on this side. But as I said, uh, well, we, we won't know because that move was not played. Spassky uh, recognized that uh, there was something even more important in this position than winning the uh, winning the exchange, and uh, and that was opening up lines against the king. And he pushed on with h5. And this is absolutely the correct decision. And in fact, it, uh, it makes this whole plan of blacks somewhat dubious because the other thing this exchange did was it brought this knight from c3 forward to uh, e4, so it's closer to the attack. Um, and now the things start to look pretty dangerous for black. At this point, Levy decides he really needs to uh, bring his queen into the game to come over to this side to defend. So he gives a pawn back and pushes the d-pawn forward, which opens up this line for the queen. The queen comes out with a tempo in a way because it's hitting the bishop, but at this point uh, Spassky decides, okay, it's time to uh, time to grab that exchange that's been on offer. So now white is, uh, uh, is up a rook and, uh, and black needs to take back a piece to only be down the exchange. And he has a choice. He can take uh, this bishop or this bishop. Uh, Levy chose to take uh, this bishop on d5, which I think makes some sense. The, um, the queen is uh, well centralized here. It's still in the area to help defend. It's also got some aggressive ideas still. He's looking at maybe coming into a2, maybe the knight hopping forward to b4, maybe the rook coming to c8 if he can't get those uh, pawns in fast enough. Um, they're definitely still attacking ideas for uh, black, so white has to play very precisely. But with precise play, actually white is just winning and has been ever since uh, uh, Levy tried this uh, tactic with knight takes e4. It's just something that did not work out against precise play. So um, you might want to uh, think about the exact move here that Spassky played at, at this point. Pause the video if you want some time to think about it. Um, uh, Spassky here came up with the, absolutely the best move in the position. He just uh, went straight for the king with the uh, queen to h6, lining up on the h-file and maybe setting up some potential mate threats uh, on g7, although the bishop at the moment is defending that. If you were tempted in this position to try and exploit this pin here, that just uh, doesn't work out. There are other good moves here, um, but anyway, queen h6 is the best. I just wanted to illustrate 
this, uh, this one idea is not working out so well for white. So for example, if you'd played c3 to try and exploit that pin, um, black can grab this bishop, you take his bishop, you stay in exchange up, but uh, black gets to take here, and all of a sudden the tables have turned. It just takes uh, you know one or two uh, imprecise moves like that to turn a position like this around. Now um, black has this threat of knight b4, and queen a1 mate, <laughs> and uh, and white has to scramble a little bit to deal with that. So anyway, queen to h6 is exactly the right move in this position. And now, um, Levy, you might have thought uh, queen a2 here was an idea. Let's check this out. He didn't play this, um, but let's check this out because it, it'll let me show some, some checkmating ideas here. Um, first of all, you sack the exchange here. Very common in these kinds of positions to sacrifice an exchange for for tactical reasons. You just uh, you you now have this mate threat that you didn't have before. So uh, Rook takes f8 is forced. He's got to defend that mate. And then um, there's actually two different uh, mating patterns here that you can you can uh, win with. One is uh, knight to g5, just uh, threatening here and here. Um, let's see. Black can give this check and uh, take over here to try and uh, disrupt the h-file, but uh, the queen breaks through first, and this, this pawn here is actually acting as a shield for the queen. Um, so that's, that's one mate. The other one is to play this way. h takes g6, threatens the immediate mate on, uh, on h7. The rook has to move out of the way to give the king an escape square, say rook c8, but uh, it's mate anyway after uh, queen h7 check, king here, queen h8 and, and the king is trapped and this this pawn is sealing in the king so he has no way out so anyway there's no time here for black to play uh, queen takes a2 i think um, one of the points is the queen in the center is prepared to take back and defend along this diagonal if white grabs the bishop so what uh, levy played was knight to b4 still hoping to get something going against uh, white's king here, but Spassky doesn't let him have any time. He now immediately plays this exchange sack. Queen, rook takes d4, queen takes d4, and um, so for the moment the queen has, um, has defended along this diagonal, but uh, just one more move from Spassky and uh, black resigned. There's probably many ways to finish it, but uh, he played the move bishop takes e7. And now there are just uh, too many threats. The basic threat is just that uh, the bishop comes here, defended by the knight, and uh, and then there's no stopping the mate on g7. Uh, but there are other ideas here. The best defense, uh, Levy didn't bother to play this out, but the best defense is knight to d5. So covering the square and stopping the bishop from coming there. Then um, And here, actually, knight g5 no longer works. This is an example of where, where you need some precision. Knight g5, the queen just comes back to g7, and uh, well actually white, white is better here. White can trade off and go for an endgame up the exchange, but he no longer has that winning attack. So that's not the best play here. The best way to play in this position is to open up the h-file if h takes g6. Um, now if the queen comes back here uh, that's that's probably best play. He can continue taking, take here with check, and then uh, let's say queen takes, then queen g5 check, looking at the king and looking at the knight over here, uh, king to h8, the bishop is guarding the other square, uh, bishop to f6 check, let's see, knight takes, knight takes, and um, and white is going to win some more material, the, the rook check here is threatened, which would win the queen for rook and knight. Uh, and if this rook comes over here to defend, there's also knight takes rook. And uh, other than that, he's going to get mated very quickly if he doesn't play something like that. So so black is uh, losing some more material in this position. So uh, in this case, uh, well, well, black uh, decided to resign after bishop to e7. I, well, there was one more defense he could have tried. Bishop to e7. Uh, knight d5, uh, h takes g6 was correct, and uh, queen to g7, 
uh, after pawn takes f7. He could have tried taking with the king. And uh, well, this leads to a little bit of an interesting position too. Uh, the queen can come over here to d6, defending the bishop and attacking these two pieces. Um, knight takes e7. And rook takes h7. This is a cute tactic. I just wanted to show this. So queen takes, knight here check, and uh, and white gets the uh, the queen back. And after that, it's just a queen against these three pieces. But uh, things are, are uh, in sad shape here. Things are hanging, and the king is exposed. And white also has these pawns that can come forward. So that's also just a winning position for white. So anyway, that's, uh, let's back up to that final position of the game with the uh, bishop takes e7. That was the, that was the last move, and uh, Levy decided to call it quits here. But um, a good example of how to uh, how to win that race. <laughs> there was never in this case White uh, was not did not really need to play a defensive move here. He was able to just go straight for the attack and just uh, get there first. And it's also a key idea that sometimes you want to sacrifice an exchange to get rid of some defenders around the king. Okay, let's take a look at the next example here. This game was played between Bobby Fischer and Bent Larson in uh, 1958 at the Porter Rose Interzonal. Bobby Fischer at the time was uh, 15 years old. He had just won the U.S. championship and become a grandmaster, and this was his first uh, big international tournament. His opponent, Bent Larson, was also a young grandmaster in his early 20s, but uh, with more experience. So uh, Bobby with the white pieces has played as usual e4, and uh, Bent Larson has gone for the dragon again. Uh, in this position, Spassky played uh, bishop d7 in the previous game, but here uh, Bent plays a move, uh, knight takes d4. So bishop takes, uh, and bishop to e6. That was the point of view. Of, the point of that exchange was to get this bishop out to a good diagonal and maybe trade off this bishop. Um, Bobby keeps the bishop, just drops it back to b3, and now the queen comes out. So um, black is playing actively with his pieces. White goes ahead and castles queen side. So now we've got the opposite side castling which situation. And uh, Larson immediately starts uh, pushing his pawns forward. And notice that um, Bobby does not immediately go for the counterattack, but plays another move here. He plays king to uh, b1. So this is a game where White uh, secures his position a bit before launching into the attack and gives uh, gives uh, Black the opportunity to make uh, first contact, as it were. Uh, Larson pushes on with b4. The knight hops into the d5 square. Of course, you always have to calculate that your pieces have safe places to go. Uh, Larson trades it off. And here, actually, um, the chess engine likes the move e takes. This would kind of take the game into different channels. You know, when there's a pawn in the center like this, uh, kind of interfering with the pieces. Well, first of all, it's protected because uh, the queen and the uh, rook here, the, the bishop can move with tempo. So after knight takes pawn, you play bishop takes bishop and get the knight. So so that pawn is protected. And it sets up a backwards pawn here on, um, on e7. So this would kind of uh, give the game a more positional turn. But that was not how the players wanted to play. Bobby wanted to keep his uh, lines open, so he played uh, bishop takes d5. And uh, Larson, in the same spirit, played rook a to c8, keeping uh, his pieces, putting his pieces on active squares and, and keeping his lines open. He, he also could have traded here. He could have played knight takes, um, and then the best line would go like this, bishop takes, um, <laughs> knight to c3. Uh, let's see, if, if just king takes, then pawn takes. And this is also a good position for white because of the uh, backwards pawn here, so that's not so great. But uh, best play from here is to throw in this intermediate knight check, mess up the pawns over here, um, and then uh, bishop takes. You can take with the bishop, rescuing it from that location, but then uh, black can uh, take here with the pawn and mess white's uh, pawns up. Oh, actually, queen takes is better. Queen takes, just play this all out, queen takes, and then b takes. And we get to this endgame very quickly where um, white is a pawn up, 
but uh, his pawns are kind of ragged. Actually, black is in pretty good shape in this uh, end game because of those isolated pawns. He can maybe round one up and get pressure on the other one. So that would be um, okay for black. But as I said, both players were not uh, really thinking along those lines. They were keeping, keeping lines open for their pieces. And, um, and so um, Bobby played uh, bishop takes b5 here rather than taking with the pawn. And rather than taking back and going into those simplifying exchanges, um, Bent plays rook to c8. So at this point now, uh, Fisher has the chance to just drop his bishop back to b3. So he gets to keep his good bishops. And uh, notice the bishop here is defending the uh, c2 pawn as well as uh, looking out at the uh, f7 pawn. So it's, it's got a dual role there, so it's doing two things. But, um, you know, Larson has got his attack advanced, and, um, and it's Black's move. And, and Fisher has seemingly not even started anything going yet. Now uh, Larson plays rook to c7, and now h4. So now the attack starts on the, uh, uh, by white. The attack by white on Black's king is, starts to get rolling. Um, Larson plays queen b5 here. He needs to get out of the way. His b pawn is blockaded at this point, and he needs to get this other pawn into the game. And this is what buys enough time for white to uh, advance his attack. So h5, now rook f to c8, piling up on the c file. H takes g6. Now this is where the uh, the role of this light squared bishop is coming into play. Notice that it's got a pin on this uh, f pawn here, so that black has to take back with the h pawn. So uh, Bobby has succeeded in objective number one, which is uh, opening up the h file, um, and uh, and now he pushes on with g4, ready to throw the next pawn into the fire. Uh, Larson continues with a5, ready to. Uh, harass the bishop with uh, a4, but g5. Uh, now white is striking first, hitting hitting the knight. And the knight hops over here to h5, trying to uh, seal off the h file. Now this is the um, this is the game that Bobby Fischer wrote about in my 60 mem memorable games. And what he said about the uh, Sicilian dragon there is, has, has been uh, quoted many times. But he said, uh, playing against the dragon is easy. You just open up the h-file, sack, sack, and mate. So here's the first sack. You sack the exchange here. And uh, and let's see. It's it's not absolutely necessary to take back. But, but uh, white or black, black ends up in some trouble anyway. There is another line here. He could have played... Uh, Bishop takes d4, leaving leaving the rook hanging for the moment, um, and white could save the rook, and then bishop back to g7, and then actually what I thought was funny about this line is the the best move here is queen f7 once again offering that exchange sack, and then when black plays at this time, which is probably the best that black has, the queen comes in with check making use of that, uh, the bishop that's sitting there quietly on b3. Uh, king goes to h8. Now you take back the bishop here. Uh, the queen comes over to defend. And then queen takes g6. And this is a position where white has uh, two pawns for the exchange, and, uh, and white's king is all exposed. So actually, this is a winning attack for white as well. So anyway, Larson just took the rook immediately. This is how the game went. And uh, Bobby pushed on with g6. So I like that. Um, if we back up, the point of the exchange was not just to get rid of that defender, but also to pull the g-pawn away so that the uh, that this pawn could advance. So it was rook takes, pawn takes, pawn to g6 in sequence. And once again, we see this weakness on f7 and the importance of this uh, bishop on b3 to the attack. So Larson... Um, starts his defense here. He starts thinking about defense at this point. There's uh, probably no time to push the uh, the a pawn forward. Oh, I guess bishop takes f7 is a sufficient answer for that. So he starts with the move uh, e5, uh, hitting hitting the bishop and shutting down at least uh, one diagonal there. Um, but Fisher throws in g takes f7, check, and then uh, the king goes to f8, just sitting behind the pawn. Uh, rook takes f8, f8, f7 was possible, but um, 
Well, what White, or what you know, what White would do probably is just uh, bring the bishop back and just uh, bring his pieces over, point them at uh, Black's king. Black's king is just awfully exposed in this position, and um, and if the king ever moves, that this rook can't move at all right now. If the king ever unpins, then the bishop at that point could always trade itself off. So so White has time to to bring some more force over here, and uh, Black is scrambling to try and a, a defense. So. Um, uh, yeah, Rick takes f7, doesn't doesn't really help all that much. He played king to f8, hiding out for a moment underneath the pawn, although he has a different idea. Let's see, uh, Bobby drops this bishop back, gets it out of trouble, and um, Larson pushes on with d5. He's trying to uh, clog up the center with pawns, and um, yeah, Bobby accepts here. He wants to keep the bishop in contact with the uh, c2 pawn. So he doesn't want to take with the bishop and have to worry about these rooks coming down here to c2. So he's holding on to his defense here, um, suffering the momentary closing of this diagonal. And um, so now Larson can grab that pawn around the king. But now Bobby can push on with d6, and this diagonal opens up again. Uh, let me see. Larson plays rook to f6 here. Bobby goes uh, bishop to g5, harassing the rook. And um, at this time, Larson decides to just give the exchange back and try and get his queen into the game. So he drops the queen back to uh, b7 so he can defend along, defend along the 7th rank there. And um, so Bobby grabs the exchange back and then pushes on with d7, which uh, interrupts the queen's uh, view of the defense here, uh, and also hits the rook. The rook goes to d8, so you know black is going to be able to round that pawn up probably, but not before um, the attack breaks through. Queen d6 check, and Larson resigns. Um, the only move here is uh, king this way. Well, actually, I'll, there's another move here. I'll come back to that. So if the king moves, though, to, to escape the check, then rook over here hits the king with check again, and the bishop is lost. The other try is uh, bishop to e7, but uh, there's a nice uh, move here. You want to take a second and see if you can spot it. Okay, I'm going to give the answer away now. The nice move is queen to h6 mate. I, I just think uh, these are... Uh, very pretty mates with the crisscrossing diagonal pieces, and notice that the pawn, which is not dead yet, is holding on to that square on e8, so the king has nowhere to run. So at this point, back up to the game, right after queen, d6 check, Larson resigned. It's a nice finish. Uh, let's take a look at the next game. I wanted to take a look at a game from a black perspective and uh, show that uh, black has some chances and ideas in this kind of position as well. Um, this is a game that was played in 1976 in Novi Sad between Velimirovic, or Matulovic and Velimirovic. So uh, Velimirovic uh, with the black pieces is uh, a well-known grandmaster. Uh, the Velimirovic attack was uh, against the Sicilian, was named after him, but he liked to play the Sicilian as well. So Matulovic started off with uh, e4. These two players are, are equally rated. Um, and uh, Velimirovic goes c5. I wanted to just go through the opening sequence again. We saw this once from the white perspective, but we can watch it from the black perspective as well. Uh, knight f3, d6. d4 open Sicilian, take. Knight takes. A knight f6 attacking the pawn. Knight c c3 defending. And g6 going for the dragon Sicilian. Now bishop e3, uh, bishop to g7, f3, uh, castles, queen to d2, knight to c6, bishop c4, and bishop d7. So this is the same position we reached in the previous games. And now white plays something different. He goes immediately with h4, not, not bothering to castle here, so not entirely securing his position before launching the attack, but hoping to get a, get a quick step uh, get in the first blow in this uh, in this race to attack the opposite side. Um, Black ignores that for the moment, plays rook c8, a very normal move in these positions. He's taking a look at the uh, loose bishop there. So the bishop drops back to b3. 
And we saw in the previous game how effective that bishop could be on this diagonal. So um, Velimirovich uh, takes steps immediately to uh, round up that bishop with knight a5. I have to say that's not the most common move here, although I, th I think it, it works out fine. Um, top choices here are h5, just stopping the pawn, or knight to e5. And knight to e5 has um, kind of a similar idea uh, to what we see in this game, because the knight from e5 will often go to c4. And so let's go back to the game. Velimirovich played knight a5. Uh, white pushed on with h5, and then he goes knight c4. So notice this knight is getting here just in time. This is white's first opportunity to take, and uh, at this point already, um, black can recapture with the f-pawn. Of course, uh, black would probably take the queen first. So, uh, uh, so uh, white has to do something about this situation. And uh, normally, um, you know, white is going to lose one bishop or the other. And normally, white chooses to give up the light squared bishop here and keep the uh, dark squared bishop, so as to have a counter for the strong dark squared bishop on g7. So bishop takes c4 is standard, and now rook takes c4. And then white can open up the h file with uh, h takes g6. But because this bishop is gone, uh, white has the move f takes g6. He can take back with the f pawn instead of the h pawn. So the h file is only partly opened. It's not opened all the way. Um, and now white decides to castle queenside. Maybe he's thinking of uh, doubling rooks here. And uh, Velimirovich plays queen c7, preparing to, uh, well, just uh, pile up on the c file there. The knight, uh, knight d goes to e2. Um, so Matulovich has some ideas for rerouting this knight, uh, but this does give up some squares when it retreats. Um, but it looks to come over here to the king side, and if necessary, it also provides some defense for that knight, although you'll see uh, white giving up on that idea pretty quickly. So rook to c8 was played here, and now king b1. So king b1 is a move that often has to be played sooner or later. We saw Fisher play that uh, pretty quickly. But um, it makes room for a rook to come to c1 if necessary to defend the pawn on uh, c2. And bishop to e6. So this knight uh, was not traded off, but it voluntarily retreated. And it uh, gave the square e6 for this bishop, so the bishop can come out to a good square. And the knight hops in to f4. So this was... Uh, this was Matulovich's idea. He wants to bring this knight over to the king side. It still looks at this uh, e6 square. And uh, Velimirovich plays an interesting move here, queen to d7. A lot of times uh, black would be tempted to try and hold on to this bishop, but um, he's just offering it in trade. And, um, and uh, Matulovich spots an idea here and plays e5. Um, this doesn't seem to work out. Let's back up. So kind of the normal move here would be just taking, and then after queen takes, bishop h6. And I think um, this is still good for white. White still has this uh, half-open h-file that he can pile up on. This attack is not yet breaking through, um, and there's a danger here. If uh, the bishop stays there, um, you know, white can trade off that bishop and then bring the queen in with check, uh, supported by the rook. And, uh, you know, if he can find a way to chase that knight away, that, that's going to be uh, curtains pretty soon. It might be best here just to drop the bishop back to h8 and play like that. But there are other moves for black as well in that position. Anyway, um, that, that might be best play for white because this uh, e5 move seems to backfire. Like I said, I think the idea was to maybe put some pressure on this knight and see if he could uh, trade it away. Or perhaps just um, open up the, uh, the d file here. But uh, Velimirovich finds an interesting uh, intermediate move. So if you haven't seen this game before, you might want to uh, ask yourself, what should black do in this position to uh, keep the initiative? Okay, or to gain the initiative, I should say. Anyway, I'm going to give the answer away now. He played uh, rook takes c3. And this type of exchange sacrifice on c3 is just very common in the Sicilian, and uh, we saw an exchange sacrifice or two in the previous game. It's the same kind of idea. You want to get rid of the defenders of the side you're attacking, and you want to activate all of your pieces. So it's often worthwhile giving up some material to accomplish that, especially as uh, 
if, as in this case, you have the ability to mess up their pawn structure and come in with a check. I think that's the key thing that really makes this uh, work here. Um, so queen b5 check, king goes to a1, and bishop to c4. So he throws in the check, and then he saves this bishop. He moves it away from the knight because this is going to be a key attacking piece. And uh, he leaves the knight hanging, but oddly enough, there's no time to take the knight. So this is uh, an important point too. If, um, if white should take here, then queen to a4 leads to, um, well, it's not an unstoppable mate, but the, the only way that uh, white can stop the mate is by playing queen d5 check and giving up the queen. So, so it leads to loss of material and loss of the game for white. So there's just no time to, um, to grab that, uh, that knight on f6, and uh, white's forced to play a defensive move here. So rook to b1, hitting the queen. The queen steps to the side, and then rook to b2, and that's the defensive idea, just defending along the second rank so the queen doesn't come in and mate. And now um, it's black's turn, though. White had to take time out to play those moves, and uh, black gets to grab this pawn. So black is the exchange down. What's interesting is that uh, he continues to play the exchange down for the rest of the game. So it's a kind of uh, uh, proves the point that you can play the exchange down for uh, quite a long time, especially if you have uh, uh, compensation in terms of activity or eventually he gets uh, pawns. So let's uh, watch how the game goes. Uh, let's see, the knight is under fire here and it uh, hops, drops back to uh, d3, so it's coming over to defend. And this knight hops into d5, coming, coming back for the attack, uh, coming out for the attack. Um, although, actually, that's not the most precise attacking move here. The, the move e4 is uh, even stronger. And um, you're going to move this knight out of the way eventually and open up this diagonal for the bishop. But, uh, you know, you're hitting this knight with the tempo. And uh, if he takes that pawn, the knight comes to this good square on... Um, comes to a good square on uh, e4, that is, instead of going to d5. So it's just not quite, I mean, we see a similar sequence in the game, but it's just not quite as good here on d5. We'll see why in a second here. This knight goes to b4, helping to defend and challenging this knight. And now a black pushes on with e4, and white has a chance to trade off this knight. So the, playing the other way would have allowed black to keep on a little more force, but uh, he still has enough here. He's still got a winning edge. The queen is supporting the bishop here. The rook is uh, firing down the c-file, and uh, there's still pressure on the a-pawn, which keeps uh, white's pieces tied up. So black is doing good here. Let's see. Uh, white plays bishop to d4 now, opposing opposing the bishop. There was uh, pressure on that c-pawn. That would have been uh, deadly. Um, and uh, black lifts the rook, rook to c4, and rook to d1. The other rook comes over. So white at this point is uh, given up on any kind of counterplay against the black king and is just going full on in defensive mode. Let's see, uh, black plays uh, bishop, yeah, it's black's turn. Bishop takes d4, he goes ahead and trades off this bishop. And um, after c takes d4, trades queens. So he just goes into the end game. He didn't see a way through to attack or to continue the attack. But um, it turns out this is a, a good end game for black. Black has picked up enough here. Rook takes d2, um, he takes f3. Has picked up enough material here that uh, he's actually got a, a very good end game. So g takes f3 was played. And then now here's, here's actually a slight mistake. There's, there's a pair of mistakes here that both sides uh, kind of exchanged. Um, it's, it's maybe getting towards the time control. It's move 31. They had a time control at move 40. They may be rushing their moves a bit and kind of heading for the end game that both of them uh, foresaw. But uh, the most accurate move here is king f7. It's a good end game, as I said, for black. He could also maybe have started with um, h5. He's got these passed pawns over here. He's got this bishop that can't be chased away from this square and can be supported by the um, can be supported by the e-pawn. So, uh, so he's really got uh, excellent condition here. 
And, um, and the pawns over here on the queen side are not so important if the king side pawns get rolling first. So, so that's the best way to play it. He played rook c3, which gives um, white a chance to uh, activate and equalize. So um, the way to activate here is to, first of all, push that f pawn forward, hold on to that one, try and try and keep something over on the king side. Then um, say rook to f3 to try and round up that pawn. Then rook to b5, hitting the bishop. And if, uh, let's see, uh, e6, defending the bishop, then uh, c4, kicking it. Bishop um, drops, oh, takes. And then rook takes b7. And um, it's just a position where, uh, you know, white has managed to activate his pieces and should be able to hold this uh, draw. I don't think uh, white has any serious winning chances as long as black doesn't make mistakes because he still has this uh, this good bishop here. Um, but anyway, that that's best play. Let's go back to the game. So, you know, rook, rook c3 was a slight mistake because it allowed that uh, continuation. And then, uh, and then um, white's next move, which was rook to d3, that was also a mistake because that allows black to go into this endgame. Black just trades here. And then grabs this pawn. Now the king runs over. Bishop drops back to a safe square. King, king keeps running. Um, and now h5, the h-pawn gets pushed. King keeps uh, keeps running. <laughs> it's got to go. Uh, king e3. I think that's why this is... Uh, he, maybe he calculated he get his king there in time. But um, g5 and the rook goes to um, c2. Maybe he's going to penetrate over here and attack the king. Um, now h3, a4 was played, king to g7. Could be that these moves were all just played, uh, you know, under the gun, because a5 was played on move 40. Um, let's see, black played the move king g6, uh, white played the move rook to f2, but then uh, resigned. Basically, there's no way that he can uh, stop these pawns from uh, from. Uh, queening except by giving up material and then it's uh, just a winning end game for black. So uh, black managed to pull that one off, a nice finish. And um, if you want to see a similar kind of game, I did a video um, about the uh, Zurich Candidates Tournament in 1953. I, I did a series of videos about that. I, I covered uh, one game from each round. And uh, the round 19 game was Boleslavski versus Geller. I'll put a, uh, a pointer to that game in this video here. But it's also uh, the same kind of uh, thing where black sacrifices the exchange on the c3 square and uh, gets, uh, gets a great game from that. So, um, yeah, if you enjoy watching or seeing, seeing more, if you want to see another example of this kind of position, that's, that's a good game to check out. Okay, um, so that covers or that finishes what I had to say about the case of attacking on uh, opposite wings where both sides have castled on opposite sides. So in the next video, I'm going to look at the other case where um, both sides are attacking on opposite wings, but they haven't uh, castled on opposite sides. So uh, stay tuned for that, and I'll see you then. Bye.